Good evening. I'm still reporting on the solution. Charlie Kirk is a 30-year-old Christian activist who, at age 18, co-founded Turning Point USA, a grassroots organization striving to motivate Christians, especially young Christians, to become active in the political process. Kirk has been the CEO, chief fundraiser, and public face of Turning Point since its founding. Um, a couple things that I want to share with you. We're in a war, everybody, and it's more clear than ever before. And we will lose if we surrender and we give up. I get a chance to travel the country. I visit college campuses, so you don't have to. Uh, everything from UCLA to UC Berkeley, Arizona State University. Um, I could tell you that despite all the headlines that you might see and the Hamas support on these campuses, there's an amazing amount of hope. When I go to these campuses, we can't find rooms big enough to fit all the students that want to attend our Turning Point USA events. It's amazing. But I hear almost every single day something that is explicitly a sin in the scriptures, despair. Far too often I see, even in Christian circles, people say, but it seems overwhelming. It's very dark out there, and that what can I possibly do? Uh, this is a time where we must not be focused on the outcome, but instead our obedience. We do what we do, not because we want to see a certain outcome. That'll be nice, but the outcome is the Lord's. The obedience is ours. We fight because God commands us to fight. These are not normal times. And I understand that some people wish that we could go back to a time of great bipartisan unity, of moderation. Some people say, but Charlie, can't we go back to the days where everybody goes along to gets along? And now I know that some of you might have mixed opinions about who to support and who to vote for in the Republican primary, whatever. But I'm, what I'm going to say are the facts, which is Donald Trump did not divide this country. He exposed the divide that already existed in this country. And he certainly has a lot of faults, we all do. But he has a lot of virtues that we rarely talk about. These are not normal times. And when I watch and I see this, these, the mockery of these Republican debates, and I see them act as if it's 1985, as if everything's fine. Donald Trump is facing 700 years in federal prison. They're doing everything they possibly can to throw that guy in jail, and he has every reason to give up, every reason to surrender and yet he keeps on fighting. They're trying to take his business empire away from him. They're trying to smear and slander his family every single day. They spied on his campaign. They impeached him twice. They lied about all the events around January 6, and yet he continues to fight. And understand, it is not him that they're going after, it is you. He just happens to be in the way. And now I know there's a lot of people that say, but I don't like his tone and I don't like his tweets. And honestly, I'm growing a little tired of these one-liners. And again, you can have all sorts of different opinions. You might support Nikki Haley, which is hilarious. You might support, good, good luck with that. But here's the bigger truth that I think we all need to acknowledge and admit. There's only one candidate that they are willing to throw everything they possibly can at. And it's a lesson for all of us, isn't it? How would you act if you were facing 700 years in federal prison? Would you give up, run for the hills? You see, there's a reason they fear him so much, is because they're afraid that you are learning from him. They're afraid that all of a sudden there are millions of grassroots activists that are no longer gonna be afraid of the media, afraid of the names that they call you. You see, for years we've allowed the media to dictate the terms of engagement. Allowed us, allowed us to cower in fear every time they called us a racist, every time they called us these sorts of names. Donald Trump played offense against some of the most bitter, awful institutions in this country. Not only did he play offense, but he refused to play the game that so many of us have been tricked into playing for all of these years. Understand that our republic, which I believe was given to us by God, is on very fragile footing right now. 
And the elites have tried everything they possibly can. They tried mass mail-in ballots. They are tr trying to go after Mike Lindell. They've gone after 1,300 people that were there on January 6th. They've gone after people that were alternate electors, a constitutional right in some of these states. They're using the FBI as a personal enforcement squad of Joe Biden. And I don't know about you, but I think this election is a lot bigger than Donald Trump and Joe Biden. When they use the instruments of the criminal justice system to go after a former president, that makes me like Donald Trump even more than before. And make no mistake, Hamas never would attack Israel if Trump was president. There would be no Ukraine and Russian war. The border would be secure. Christopher Wray would not continue his terror campaign against American citizens. The only reason we got Roe versus Wade repealed is thanks to Donald Trump putting Amy Coney Barrett, Kavanaugh, and Gorsuch on the Supreme Court. Now, I'm not even here to say you must vote for the man, but you should thank God that he is fighting for you every single day. So what does that mean for all of us? We, have a, we still have an opportunity to save this great country, but it's bigger than politics. It involves every single facet of our life, how we educate our kids, whether or not we're gonna stand up the totalitarian bullies in our own life, whether or not we turn our back on somebody that might have been canceled for saying some wrong think thing. And yes, the fight matters in your churches. One of the things that I have dedicated some of our work at TPUSA Faith to, which is why I love working with Flashpoint, is getting the church to stand biblically and courageously against wokeism both outside and inside the church. Understand that a vast majority of seminaries in this country are infected with the woke mind virus, postmodernism, social relativism. It should be of no mystery and no mistake when you see some of these people come out like Russell Moore or Andy Stanley or Rick Warren, and by the way, I name names, I'm sorry everybody, but time is running out. And so many of these feckless cowards that call themselves pastors, and they come out and they say, you know what, uh, gay marriage is okay, or transgenderism, there's nothing wrong with it. We must excommunicate wokeism out of the American church. It is from the pit of hell. And if we are honest with ourselves, one of the reasons why we are in the mess that we are in is because we in the church got complacent. I blame us first. We should not blame a secular world for our country falling apart. It's because the church did not stand on biblical truth. It's because the church was more worried about expanding their wardrobe budget than their book budget. It's because the church was unwilling to say to a world, I don't care if you hate me, I only answer to God and God alone. And one of the reasons why I love what Flashpoint is doing and this amazing ministry, it's going out into the nation, the country, and speaking to all of you and empowering pastors to stand with biblical courage. But maybe you go to a church and they're wavering a little bit. And they say, we don't do politics around here. You should say, well, you do, do you do the Bible around here? How about Esther, Mordecai, Nehemiah, Jeremiah, or Joseph? They were awfully political. They were counselors to the king. It says in Jeremiah 29, 7, demand the welfare of the nation that you are in because your welfare is tied to your nation's welfare. Daniel fasted and prayed for the nation that he is in, who is in. God cares about whether or not you care for your nation. And we should love our neighbor as yourself, as it says in Leviticus 19. Christ says all the commandments are on Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Deuteronomy 6, 5. In Leviticus 19, it says, Love your neighbor as yourself, as well as some other amazing teachings. We cannot love our neighbor as ourself if you have a Marxist totalitarian government. The best way to love your neighbor is to give them the gift that God first gave us, which is liberty, which is God's idea, not man's idea. A free society is the greatest gift that we can give a neighbor. 
And yet, Christians across the country sit idly by. They sit on their hands. A majority of pastors did not thank the Lord that Roe versus Wade was repealed. The church founded this country. 55 out of 56 of the signers of the Declaration of Independence were Bible-believing, church-attending Christians. Nine out of 13 of the original state constitutions of the 13 original colonies said that you must be a Protestant Christian to be an office holder at the time of the American founding. Almost all 13 out of 13 said you must believe in Almighty God. This was founded as a Christian country, and it will be Christians that will save it. And yet, we have bought the lie that is peddled by too many of these fake pastors across the country. They sell you your book and say that I just want happiness and I want peace on earth. Yes, Christ will bring peace on, bring peace on earth, but first he must bring a sword, and the sword is the word of God. And the word of God will cut through the lies of our culture. But I hear from people like Andy Stanley, he says, well, you know, we must... Um, we must meet young people where they're at, that you're going to turn young people off if you talk the truth too bluntly and clearly. Well, how's that working out? We have watered down the Word of God for the last 30 years, and church attendance is down. I can tell you how to pack an auditorium full of 18, 19, and 20-year-olds. I do it every single night. You know how you do it? You tell the truth plainly and repeatedly to a generation that needs to hear it. This is a testing moment for the church, and if we're honest, most churches failed during COVID. We masked in fear and hid behind Romans 13, an inappropriate analysis of Romans 13, saying that we must submit to our government leaders and authorities and those that are there because they're there for our good, even though when you ask the pastor the next question, well, who's the authority in America? It's we the people in America, not the mayors, not the governors, but they don't read that far. It is the church that needs to rise, that needs to stand for this biblical truth and identify wokeism wherever we see it. And in 2024, it will be a testing moment. You're going to hear from the Russell Moore types, oh, don't get involved in politics. There's no difference between the two parties. Excuse me. Now, by the way, there's plenty of problems with the Republican Party. I do a three-hour show about it every single day. You guys should listen. It's the Charlie Kirk Show. I know some of you guys do. Thank you, by the way. I complain more about Republicans than Democrats every single day. But hold on a second. Let's get our facts right. There are three things that every pastor should agree on, and if they don't, they should resign from the ministry. Number one, life begins at conception, and that abortion has no place in America. Number two... God created male and female, and this transgenderism nonsense will end in this country. And to go a step further, you will not mutilate our children. You will not teach them this gay pornography. You will not go after them with this trans agenda. Our children are off limits, period. Finally, that we will never allow the bride of Christ, the church, to be labeled non-essential again. When marijuana dispensaries, liquor stores, and convenience stores were lamed essential, we will never close the church for what you call a pandemic again, period. You need to go home to your pastor and ask those three questions. When does life begin? Do you believe God created male and female? in his image, and do you believe the church is essential? That is your three-part test. That is not political, that is biblical. And if every pastor asked those questions and answered them correctly, the country could be saved. But it starts with you. It starts with you getting a coffee with your senior pastor and asking them, they say, well, I don't wanna lose people. They say, then you shouldn't be a pastor. You should try to preach your church down to a manageable size telling the truth. And if God blesses you with increased attendance, that's God's provision and blessing, not because of your talented preaching. But, but I, uh, 
I, I, I have an elder board. Oh, they say mean things? You should preach the truth, and if the elder board fires you for preaching the Bible, then they will have to stand in front of Almighty God and account for that. But I, um, I don't know. It's just, it's just not clear. There, there's no difference between the two parties. Again, there's a lot of problems in this country, I could tell you. There is one party that believes in post-birth abortion. There's one party that is pushing this transgenderism poison on every one of your children. In this state, the state of California, and God bless you for fighting for California, by the way. Do not give up on California. The Democrats in the Senate and the House agreed to block a bill that would have notified you as a parent if your teenager was currently undergoing transgender conversion therapy. Simple notification. The Democrats don't even want you as a parent to know what is happening. And it's very simple and very clear. The church does a poor job of this because the church has its motives all wrong. What is the best way to fight Marxism? It's the family. It is the only one of the Ten Commandments that involves a promise and your nation. Honor your mother and father so that you may live long in the land of which you are in. The transgender lobby, the Marxists, the totalitarians, the tyrants, the Democrats, the despots, but I repeat myself. <laughs> they know that they have to separate the bond between a parent and a child. For all those of us that are parents, myself now included, by the way, we must protect our children from the groomers. And that's right, I call them groomers, and they hate it when we call them groomers. There are three types of people in this world. There are infants, there are predators and the protectors of children. Many of you are no longer infants, thankfully. I hear some infants in the back, God bless them. So that means you could be in one of two categories. You could be a predator or a protector of children. It is incumbent on good people to protect our children from the predators. The predators in the public school system, the predators that seek to come after your children's innocence. And pastors need to say that clearly and plainly and repeatedly. This is not a political war. This is a biblical and a spiritual war. I get a lot of emails from many of you, and you say, Charlie, what else can I do? Some of you even say, I've done everything that's been asked of me. I watch Flashpoint. I bought the pillow. <laughs> By the way, let's clear this up. Promo code Kirk. Okay. I don't know what all this other nonsense is. K-I-R-K. -K. By the way, that's the easiest of all to remember, okay? From a, it means church, by the way, okay? So there you go. Eric, I don't know what that means. So promo code Kirk. Okay, we got that out of the way. Make a commitment to do more. No longer be a spectator, but be a participant in the fight for liberty and freedom. Get in the arena. Homeschool your kids. Take your kids out of government schools, everybody. Support your local Turning Point USA chapter. Run for precinct committeeman. Hold your pastor accountable. Leave your church if it's gone woke. Have the tough conversation with your loved one. Become a relentless fighter for liberty and freedom because the bad guys are trying to invoke your surrender. They're trying to get you to give up, and I'll end how I started. Look at the man who's facing 700 years in prison and his business empire about to be taken away. Nobody can tell me you have it harder than Donald Trump right now. Nobody. I hear complaints all day long. But I could lose my job and someone could say a bad word about me. Donald Trump's about to lose everything he's ever earned. His name, his reputation, his, his family, his wealth. He, about to, he might go to jail for the rest of his life, but he keeps on fighting for you. So I don't want to hear your complaints. I want to see you fight. I want to see you fight with everything that you have. The greatest man to live in the 20th century was Winston Churchill. Trump is very similar to Churchill. Hated before, loved during, hated after. A little rough around the edges, but necessary, blunt, and courageous. Churchill was the only man that was smiling the day after Pearl Harbor. His team came in, the war cabinet convened the day after Pearl Harbor, and they were downtrodden and sad, and Churchill was very happy with a cigar and a thing of whiskey, and 
he proclaimed to his war cabinet, we have won the war. And his war cabinet said, what are you talking about? Gents, we have won the war. And a brave soul said, sir, have you lost your bloody mind? He said, we, we could barely staff the Royal Air Force. They're planning a ground invasion of Brighton. We barely got our troops off Dunkirk. There is a vote of no confidence planned for you. What do you mean we've won the war? And Churchill took a puff of a cigar and a sip of whiskey, and he says, ah, I've studied the Americans and got to know them quite well. They're often late to the party, but once Americans awaken, they are a beast that cannot be defeated. You awaken, everybody. We win. God bless you guys. Thank you so much. I'm still reporting from just outside the Citadel of World Freedom today.